South America, a country slightly smaller than the state of Alaska. Colombia's chief aim is to build a just, modern, and prosperous society, a task burdened by widespread poverty and ignorance, conditions which have existed for centuries. At election time, each candidate loudly and confidently assures the voter that his party's platform is the way to prosperity. The Colombian takes his politics seriously, and on election day, beatings, riots, and even murders are commonplace. Voters are systematically searched for hidden weapons as they enter the polls. The Colombian dreams of a democratic political system. Too often, their dream has been a horrible nightmare. During the past 18 years, more than 300,000 men, women, and children have been murdered victims of senseless political vengeance. The Colombian is deeply religious, and the ritual and ceremony of his church appeal strongly to his religious nature. Yet all this has left him empty and without assurance of sins forgiven. For more than three centuries, the Church of Rome's influence has been almost absolute and unchallenged. Superstition and darkness have held millions in the chains of bondage and fear. Colombia is caught in an intense economic, social, political, and religious conflict. But in the midst of this conflict, there is an amazing spiritual awakening. Never has there been greater response to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A mighty conquest over spiritual darkness, superstition, and evil is taking place. In 1932, the worldwide evangelization crusade entered Colombia. Bogota, the nation's capital, was selected as the principal base of operation. This great city has a present population of one and a half million, 10% of the nation's total population. It is situated 7,000 feet above sea level on the eastern slope of the gigantic Andes Mountains. Bogota's climate is ideal and provides a place of welcome relief for our missionaries working in the hot, humid lowlands. The work was begun by an Australian missionary, Reverend Pat Symes, who had previously worked on the upper Amazon in Brazil. From the beginning, Mr. Symes' unswerving purpose was to train Colombian Christians to evangelize their own nation. A Bible school was established at Bogota, and under the able leadership of Reverend Ken Chapman, it had a phenomenal growth. The original school began in 1938, a renovated stable serving for classrooms and dormitories. Since that time, several building programs have been undertaken to accommodate the growing student body. The student pays his own way, and part of the cost of his education is made up through a work program in which all participate. They come from all parts of Colombia and represent various mission societies. One of the important phases of their training is to impart to them the responsibility for the evangelization of their own people. Instructions in practical evangelism are given, and Mr. Chapman points out areas in and around Bogota where open-air meetings should be conducted. When the classes have ended, the students pack a good supply of Christian literature, which is an important part of our evangelistic efforts, 
and then leave for one of Bogota's suburbs or an adjoining town to conduct an open-air meeting. several occasions, these young people have encountered unfriendly and even hostile crowds, and on some occasions have experienced violence, such as the afternoon when the truck was bombarded with large stones. God miraculously delivered them from serious injury, and they were unmoved from their purpose to continue with the open-air meeting. The fearlessness of these young people as they boldly preach in the open with the knowledge that they may face a violent or hostile crowd is an inspiration and a testimony to their faith. Today there is a mighty spiritual movement taking place among the young people in Colombia who have dared to overthrow the traditions of the past. They call themselves rebels for Christ. The students learn in the classroom that there are still hundreds of towns and villages totally unevangelized and that the responsibility for reaching them rests largely upon the Colombian Christians. One area in which the worldwide evangelization crusade is working is along the mighty Magdalena River, which flows almost the entire length of the country. Since the river is partially navigable, hundreds of towns and cities have sprung up along its banks. The townspeople depend for the most part upon fishing for a livelihood. When fishing is poor, the people suffer critically. One of the towns along this river where our mission is working is La Dorada. The large open market is usually the main center of attraction. It is interesting to see the variety of items for sale. A visit to the open air meat market makes one profoundly thankful that his purchase will be well cooked before serving. Every part of the animal is sold. And someone has stated that there are two kinds of meat for sale in Colombia, with bones and without. From morning till night, the market is crowded. Some come for a social visit. For others, it may be a refreshing glass of buttermilk or to have one's fortune told. Unfortunately, many will end up at the crude sidewalk saloon, exchanging idle gossip and perhaps dreaming of a better future but the results are always the same. Bullfighting is commonplace in Colombia, and even the small towns have at least a crude arena. The bullfight is to South America what the rodeo is to North America. Each small town has its own local matadors, whose accomplishments seem to be more in the field of clowning than in the art of bullfighting. No one in Colombia appears to be in any great hurry, and the performance may consume an entire afternoon. Colombia is nominally 90% Roman Catholic, it is reported that less than 20% of the adults regularly attend Mass, but the children are required to do so. The worldwide evangelization crusade now has approximately 70 congregations. Some of these meet in homes, while others have built fine buildings. All of these churches are supported by the Colombian Christians. The majority of our churches have national pastors, and our aim is that all will have them shortly. The pastor at La Dorada, a graduate of our Bible Institute, is one of about 70 national workers now associated with the crusade in Colombia. Our Bible school training is designed not only to give the students a good knowledge of the Bible, but to help them have a vital and personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Total commitment to Christ is imperative in this land which has suffered under violent persecution. These students 
who have wholly committed themselves to Christ are able to encourage and exhort others to unswerving faith in Christ, even in the face of suffering and possible death. The Christians are keenly aware of the hostility they face, for in the past 18 years, about 130 Colombians have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Several of them are buried at this spot. While it has meant death for some, for others there has been miraculous deliverance, as in the case of this believer, whose home was riddled with bullets. The rural areas have been the special targets of those who oppose the evangelicals. At times, waves of violent persecution have threatened the very existence of some of our outlying churches. One such congregation was in a tiny town high in the Andes called Cuibuco. The four-hour drive from Bogota to Cuibuco along the narrow, twisting mountain roads is punctuated by the magnificent scenery the lush green foliage, majestic waterfalls, and sometimes disaster. To encounter another vehicle on the wrong side of the road on a curve is commonplace, and sometimes fatal. At the end of this hair-raising ride, the missionary and baggage are transferred to horse and muleback. For the next three hours, the missionary just slips and sloshes his way along the narrow mountain trail until he finally reaches the tiny village hidden deep in the Andes Mountains. awaits the missionary. And for a feast, it will not be the fatted calf, but a nice plump turkey, whose feathers are plucked out while the bird is still alive. 55% of Colombia's population is engaged in agriculture. The country's economy rests largely upon the coffee crop. Colombia is the world's second largest exporter of coffee. Most of the coffee beans are produced by small growers, such as these in the Cuibuco area. Sugar is also a leading industry, and like the coffee, much of it is produced by the small growers who press and refine the sugar right on the spot. Although the country people are usually quite poor, these evangelicals have erected a splendid house of worship. The cement was hauled by muleback over the treacherous mountain trails, and the sand brought in buckets from the river far below. Because the children of the evangelicals have suffered harassment, ridicule, and beatings, the mission has established its own schools. At present, about 30 of those schools are taught by graduates of our Bible Institute. In these remote areas, the sword of persecution falls suddenly and without warning. A case in point, Don Louis, a peasant farmer who had put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For this crime, he was attacked by four men, dragged from his home before the horrified eyes of his wife and savagely beaten. His body was slashed and his skull broken. When the would-be assassins had gone, friendly neighbors wrapped his head tightly with sheets in an effort to stop the terrible flow of blood, and then carried him in a litter down the long mountain trail. From there, it was a 24-hour bus trip to the mission's clinic at Bogota, during which they had to change buses several times. 
Don Luis' only crime was that he had put his faith solely in Jesus Christ. doctors saw the extent of his injuries, they were amazed that he had survived this grueling trip. Our Colombian Christians are indeed grateful for the modern and magnificent hospital which had come into being through the vision of one of our missionaries. In 1948, Miss Frances Hancocks returned to Colombia from furlough. She was burdened to begin a medical work which would care for many for whom medical help was unavailable. She was especially concerned because so many women died needlessly and in terrible agony during childbirth through lack of simple help. To begin such a medical program, she had nothing but faith in God and undying love for the people. In fact, when Miss Hancocks began, the clinic was so poorly equipped, the first inpatient slept in her bed while she slept on a small cot. But God was faithful and began to send in funds. Colombian doctors, many of them specialists, contributed their professional skills so that today our mission has one of the most modern hospitals in Colombia, capable of handling all types of complex operations. More than 3,000 patients are handled each month. Although the clinic has now branched out to take care of all types of diseases and afflictions, the maternity ward handles by far the largest number of patients. All patients are given loving, courteous, and personal attention. The entire cost for a maternity case, including hospitalization, is about $20, and the hospital is being run at a profit. The love and concern for each patient shown by our Christian staff has resulted in large numbers seeking admittance. It is required that the nurses attend our Bible Institute in order to deal with the spiritual as well as the physical needs of the patient. There are often complications during childbirth, but our skilled personnel and modern equipment are capable of handling any emergency. The new arrival brings great joy to the parents and relatives but also a deep sense of responsibility, knowing that this little life is entering a world overflowing with violence and wickedness. A modern and fully equipped pharmacy assures the patient of all necessary supplies and medications. The expansion of the work has been largely through the tireless and efficient efforts of our hospital administrator, Miss Marion Price. A series of miracles has brought the hospital to where it is. And now, by faith, Miss Price is laying plans for the erection of a new, modern building in the suburbs of Bogota, adequate to care for the needs of all who seek help. The pioneer aspects of our work are kept before the students continually. They are reminded that on the plains and in the jungles of southeast Colombia, there are numerous Indian tribes still wholly unevangelized. For many years, evangelical missions had been prohibited from working among these Indian tribes as a result of a treaty made in 1902 between the Vatican and the Colombian government. However, the present government has a more liberal outlook and evangelical missions are rapidly establishing work among these tribes. Beyond the expansive plains that stretch out as far as the eye can see are hundreds of small Indian villages. These are located along the headwaters of the Amazon and Orinoco rivers. In order to reach the nearest Indian villages, one must travel two days across these bandit-infested plains. 
The land is used primarily for cattle grazing, a fine grade of cattle produced through the crossing of native stock with India's Brahmin bulls. A royal welcome awaits the missionary when he arrives at one of the Indian villages. The glamour is soon over though, as the sick and afflicted begin to flock about the jeep seeking medical help. Many of these infections could have been prevented through proper and early help. But as is often the case, by the time the missionary arrives, the affliction or disease has progressed to a point of severe complications. The spiritual and physical need is so great that the missionary often finds himself overwhelmed. And his constant prayer is that God will stir the hearts of many young men and women to help in these needy areas. At the news of the missionary's arrival, Christians gather from surrounding villages to hear the word of God. A hastily planned Bible conference is no particular problem. With all hands on deck, a temporary communal house is erected in short order. Each village sends in some food, so there should be plenty for all. Young and old help to prepare the meals. One interesting process is the making of bread with a root called yucca. This root must be cleaned, scraped, and then grated into a pulp. It is then put into a long woven squeezer and the entire family takes part in squeezing the poisonous juice from the yucca. The squeezed and dried pulp is then baked like bread. Mealtime is a time of great delight for all and the fellowship, as well as the good food, are thoroughly enjoyed by all. It is probably difficult for us to understand the great change that has come to these believers since they have put their faith in Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior. This transformation has created a profound effect upon others, and one of the great joys of conference is to witness others giving personal testimony to their faith in Jesus Christ through public baptism. These Christians are surrounded by evil practices, superstitions, and worship of devils. They are much in need of prayer, encouragement, and strengthening through God's word. So as the conference concludes, the missionaries commend these simple believers to the grace of God. The day comes to a close. Stillness and darkness settle in upon this little Indian village. The maze of swinging hammocks is outlined in the dim light of small oil lamps and open fires. The sound of night is broken by a song. Miracle of miracles, men and women who once worshipped devils now end the day singing praises to the great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today is ended, but tomorrow is just ahead and the challenge grows as new lives are born. O oh God, praise our missionary, open the eyes of young people everywhere to see the glory in a life utterly dedicated to the Master and poured out for the salvation of lost humanity.